You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I'm recording this in a beautiful cafe restaurant in Valparaiso in Chile, in a Victorian building on, on the hills. And I'm very pleased to have a special guest, uh, an expat entrepreneur in Chile called Edwin. Edwin, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, I thought it would be really interesting to chat to you about your experience um, as an entrepreneur here in Chile. I know it's a, you know, as you know, I'm traveling through South America looking at different countries. First of all, though, could you just give a little bit of a background to, you know, how you came to be here, what your background is? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in Chile mainly because Chile is generally free market, um, especially compared to other countries in South America. That's changing, um, but it's certainly more developed and, uh, than some other places. My original idea here was to start a shave ice business, um, and then the bureaucracy sort of slowed me down a bit too much. Right. So that, that'll be uh, delayed till next year. And uh, in the meantime, I'm thinking of like doing some English tutoring. So my background. Um, yeah, I studied economics at the University of Chicago, which was eye-opening. So I started out uh, thinking I'd go into sociology. Um, and Edwards was my guide during the 2008 election when he dropped out looked into the other candidates and, uh, you know, was interested in Ron Paul, one of the guys who had a Ron Paul bumper sticker on his computer, and we chatted a bit, and he talked about uh, LouRockwell.com, and as they say, one thing led to another. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it went from uh, being like, oh, yeah, Marx makes a lot of sense in my first year to... Uh, my third year, between my um, third and fourth year, uh, you know, reading Human Action while in New Hampshire, looking into the Free State Project. Right, right. <laughs> and is that when you decided that you wanted to pursue entrepreneurship? Um, it's been something I've been interested in since I was uh, very young. Um, like, you know, m my siblings and I, uh, we'd have the sort of, silly little businesses that you do when you're kids, um, like collect flower seeds from the backyard and try to sell those and stuff. And when, so my family has been coming down here for a while, uh, and one summer, that's winter in the northern, northern hemisphere, but one summer down here, uh, we were on a beach and somebody was like, hey, shave ice would be good, but they didn't have any, and it's like, oh, okay, well. That's I could do that. Right? Yeah, totally. Right. One big thing for me is getting out of the U.S. Right. Um, I've, like I mentioned before, um, I've been uh, interested in that since Bush was re-elected. Um, I can't stand the wars. And I, from what I see, I can only see that getting worse. Right. Um, so, yeah. And... On top of that, I don't know, there's sort of a general, well, what if this, that, or the other thing happened? The Strait of Malacca is shut down, uh, Strait of Hormuz, etc. What do you do? There could be major problems very quickly. And something I like about Chile is that it exports food. Yeah, so it has that sort of um, potentially good place to be in in economic catastrophe insurance yeah. theme to it. And energy here is incredibly expensive, which is bad. But on the other hand, that's good because, like, I don't know if you've seen in Valparaiso yet, sometimes you'll see just guys on horses, mm. um, and that's how they brought <laughs> their, their stuff from uh, the farms that are just yeah. a couple miles that away. Like, you'll see a guy on horseback with 50-pound bags mm. of oranges or whatever, and, uh, I'm guessing you, your thoughts on that are that if things really do go badly in terms of oil availability and so forth, then this is the kind of place that might be better to be. Yeah, I, uh, big cities in general are a bad idea, but so that's 
that's a bad idea. But on the other hand, um, Chile has earthquakes all the time. Two years ago, my parents were here for, I think it was an 8.5, the, the big one. And, um, you know, just things are level, like not level, but huge problems and people just take it in stride. Yeah. And I really like that attitude and um, the food's great, um, the people are awesome, and it's uh, much more laid back than, than the States. Mm. It, it, it is a really nice atmosphere here. And I, I think, um, and I want to ask, ask you more about, um, you know, the actual experience of living here. But I think, you know, you've got your reasons for wanting to leave the States and do entrepreneurship abroad. Lots of other people have um, their own reasons too question is how to do it and you know how to um how you can actually come and be an entrepreneur here now i want to ask you about your experience because you are um on a an entrepreneurship visa which which is something i think could be really interesting for people so what is a chilean entrepreneurship visa so um chile is uh looking to bring in foreigners Um, and especially people for investment and opening businesses. Um, The visa I'm on, you basically show your passport, your little ticket thing when you come into the country. Um, You present them sort of a business plan, and um, you show that you have the capital for both your living expenses and to open the business. And then they give you the visa, and it's uh, for only a year, so it's sort of like, well, get get to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, and getting that was kind of an adventure. Um, there's a guy who was absolutely essential. Like, I couldn't have um, gotten the visa without him. Um, we did have a bit of a miscommunication about what was required for importation, mm-hmm. uh, which was probably more my fault than his. Um, But anyway, by the time I cleared that up, I had met um, a Chilean lawyer through a family acquaintance and got help from him. Um, The Chilean bureaucracy is... So like we were talking about, um, other South American countries can be... Some of them are a lot more corrupt Mm. than Chile. And the way Chile keeps corruption down is through layers and layers of bureaucracy. So it's you get this thing stamped and then you take it over to this guy to get it signed and then to that guy to get it translated right. or whatever and then it needs to be stamped again because the translation by the government isn't enough it has to be yes this is, this guy actually does work in the government whatever i get from what you're saying there that is that you know there's a lot of hoops to jump through you basically got to you got to present various information and so forth and in order to get that done you probably need to look at getting some local help, or you might need to think about getting some local help from a local lawyer or something like that. Yeah, um, it's it's probably a good idea. Like, looking back, it seems straightforward looking forward. Yeah, and nobody tells you what you need to do next until you get the thing done. Um, I don't know if your listeners would be interested if they are. I mean, if somebody's interested, we could probably work something out if cool. anybody has questions about that or whatever, um, I may talk to my uh, to Felipe, uh, my lawyer down here, and see if he'd be interested in like yeah, sure. some sort of arrangement. Yeah, but, yeah. Sure. But so uh, you then you're in a situation then now where you now have an entrepreneurship visa, so you're able to stay here for a year, mm-hmm. um, and you know, does that mean that you can just? Um, open bank accounts, live like a Chilean and do everything else? <laughs> well, okay, so the visa, just come here visa, is really, really straightforward. Um, it's 90 days, you just show up, and they give you a little slip, and it's all good. I think it's 120 or something like that, uh, but one time, stamp your passport, whatever, and then you can come as many times as you want. Um, what I have is a visa that allows me to get um, a carnet de identidad right. or a sudelo de identidad um, which is this guy and then the other thing that you can have which is also a root which is sort of your national ID is um, this one which so uh, this is a temporary thing 
Oh, sorry, I should probably explain no, this that's better. Okay. So you ba- yeah, so you basically you get access to these two cards, identity cards and so forth, if you've got your visa. Well, the first one you don't... The, so one of them you don't need a more permanent visa to get. It allows you to rent places and stuff. Um, and it used to allow you to open a bank account. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. And actually, I'm having... I can't open a bank account until I'm employed, which I haven't, I'm not yeah. yet. Cause. Well, I think this is maybe also, like we were talking about, this is maybe one of the things that is to do um, with problems that um, expat Americans are having all over the world, which is to do with the reporting requirements for um, foreign banks if they are going right. to take on American clients. So in our discussion before, the, before we started recording, we, we were saying it might be to do with the fact that you are an American right. citizen, so maybe that's why you're having difficulty here. Right. Well, um, so my parents in 2007, 2008, around there, were able to open a bank account. Not no problems, but it was uh, possible. Uh, I went with theoretically more uh, paperwork. And uh, it was not possible. And so I, th- I don't know if that's just because of um, a difference in age and assets or if that's the requirements have gotten stricter because of... Um, Compliance. Yeah, yeah. And just the bank not wanting to deal with U.S. clients. Um, I, and it may be both. Or maybe a combination or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm very interested to see if this creates kind of a, um, a situation where you have U.S. banking, sort of a U.S. banking system, and then the non-U.S. banking system. So there are these teething problems to do with, obviously you mentioned the bureaucracy and, um, and maybe some issues if you're an American that you might encounter to do with uh, compliance and so forth. One of the things that um, I'd be curious to hear about is the business culture in Chile. I mean, I, you know, just arriving from Argentina, some things that you notice, like Chile definitely you can see the development very much more clearly. You can see that this is a country that is uh, growing quickly, it has been, and uh, it's, you know, according to all of the economic freedom indices, it's one of the freest um, countries in the world in economic terms. But what's, what's, the, you know, what's it like dealing with people, doing business? Is it a very business-friendly culture, or you know, what's your experience of that been? Um, it's reasonably dynamic. One thing is that it's pretty concentrated, um, which was done intentionally. Uh, One thing that the Chicago boys were worried about was that Chilean companies wouldn't be able to compete uh, on an international stage. This is um, the Chicago boys who came over in the 1970s when Pinochet was in and sort of like basically advised on the liberalization of the economy, right? The Milton Friedman and the, the whole sort of Chicago school, which was quite influential on changing the, well, the government policy towards... Um, economic development and particularly towards entrepreneurship here. Yeah. So yeah, you're saying that they 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 did things that particularly favoured concentration of firms. Yeah. Um, not, and it's not in, incredible, but it's been 20, 30 years, so uh, it has had an effect. Um, and so the gap between the the wealthy and uh, the poor is huge. It's one of the largest in the world. Um, and that that's partially because of those regulations, partially um, sort of just endowment effects. That was the way it was since the 1500s. And the Chilean government is aware of that, and they're trying to, to sort of change it, which is why, or one of the reasons why, they're so friendly to... Um, foreigners trying to come in, invest, start businesses, mm. etc. Um, and actually they have the, um, shoot, what do they call it? Something Chile. Startup Chile right. thing, which we talked about. Um, I haven't done that uh, that's some kind of grant program, right? right? Yeah, right. yeah. And that obviously has strings attached and so mm-hmm. forth. Mm-hmm. And I've met some people um, who are working for companies that were doing that. Um, 
my impression was that they're looking for more tech mm -hmm. or green, which is fine if that's what you're looking for. Um, I wasn't sure that's what I want to do. I have no, I don't have much background in computers mm. or anything like that. Um, and also, I was very wary of the strings. Yeah. And um, and I kind of have uh, reservations about taking uh, money from a government yeah. in terms of uh, morality. <laughs> yeah. No, I I completely understand where you're coming from. But it's interesting to hear, um, uh, you know, your your take on the different routes in for other people to consider if that's what they're interested in. We've talked about some of the um, sort of technical hitches and things that you might need to consider if you're interested in coming here. What about the life here um, as an expat? Uh, what are your experiences about Chile in terms of things like cost, convenience, the lifestyle, and, yeah. and so forth? Yeah, I think different people in different parts of Chile will have a very different take on that. For me, uh, my costs are in incredibly low, like stunningly low. Mm. Um, food here can be very, very cheap, um, and you can get very high-quality produce for very little money. You can also get high-quality produce for even more expensive in the U.S., right. depending on what you're you, buying. Right. Yeah, where you're buying, what you're buying. Convenience, like the bus system here in Vina, I actually really, Vina, Balpo, Rinyaka, Concon, etc., I really, really like. Like, it's just... You can have a car. It's more expensive in the U.S. than in the U.S. Uh, because gas is more expensive here. And also, it's uh, there are rules here against importing used cars. It's possible, but it's a bitch. Mm -hmm. So people... Yeah, I mean, I know somebody who tried. I think it took them three years. Wow. Yeah. And their impression was, every at every point, uh, the person who had to do the approval, uh, was trying to hold on to it as long as possible right. in case that something happened. It would be under their department or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's... Um, it, used cars here are very expensive relative to other parts of the world. Uh, but the bus system is awesome. Um, yeah, costs are low. Energy is expensive. Um, but, I don't know, I... Uh, I like it, and it's very uh, relaxed. Mm. Um, on the other hand, I do know that in Santiago, for instance, there are uh, places with a lot of extranjeros, a lot of foreigners. Um, so people from Australia and the U.S. and France and England and all over the world uh, for mining or various things like Monsanto as well, agriculture. Mm. Um, and in those areas, it's, uh, you know, Chicago expensive. It's right. So you can basically, if you want to live it up, so to speak, you can find yourself paying just as much as you would in the States. Yeah. But if you want to live as a uh, shoestring entrepreneur on a budget, you know, you can, you, would you say that, um, is it possible to compare your things just like accommodation, transport, food? Right. Would you say that are we talking like eighty percent of U.S. prices or sixty, or do you, is it is it possible to make an estimate of that? I'm probably all in, uh, several hundred a month, maybe um, dollars. Yes, then that includes all your rent. Yes. And everything. Well, yes. that's yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Um, now, it, presumably, rent is one of your major costs. And did you? Is that uh, well? So, did you? Is, is it a question of who you know and finding a good place no, or something? No. Oh, I, I did that because I live in my parents' apartment. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Right, uh, so you, you're saving on that cost, right? Um, however, uh, I've seen places where if you just wanted a room, a place to live, uh, that were seventy thousand a month, seventy thousand pesos. So that's a hundred forty a month. Uh, USD. USD, yeah. Right. So it's... Uh, so even though you're living at your parents' place still, the, there's pretty cheap places going. Yeah, yeah. And um, so like when I was in Hawaii, 700 a month got you a room and you got to use the bathroom. You were allowed to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, here, 700 a month would get you a two-bedroom apartment. Right. It's not expensive. Mm -hmm. 
Has it now? Has it been getting more expensive with the economy growing? I mean, what's the uh, actually no? Because the, that's one of the things about Chile that's interesting is that it, it's not very inflation ridden compared to other economies because it's had that sort of monetarist yeah. approach. Yeah, the the UF is prevent inflation. They're still affected by food prices. Now, what the UF is is a really interesting thing here. Mm-hmm. So, can you just explain what uh, what that is? Yeah, I mean, they're essentially as uh, zero coupon bond. Um, it's so they track inflation. Um, it's if you have one UFA, I think that's forty five dollars a mas or menos right now, um, and then that goes up with government reported inflation. Right. Obviously, the government gets to set the figures, but nonetheless, exactly. it, it is so. It is yeah, basically yeah. a unit of currency accounting that mm-hmm. people use in trade, mm-hmm. which is kind of inflation protected. Right, right. And so people's um, salaries will be in UFAs. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. You, uh, rent is in UFAs. Mortgages are in UFAs. Um, people will often have savings accounts in UFAs. Um, so it allows for uh, better planning, better economic foresight. And um, right now, I think the, the yield on UF, an UFA bond is like 3%. So that's Basically, a tip, except Chilean, um, that's yielding three percent. And uh, I don't know. In this in, in this environment, that doesn't sound shitty to me. Yeah. So that means that you're getting a three percent real yield, a yeah. real return, which means that you can actually plan your economic life without having to think about inflation and well, I don't know if I make this, then that, and so forth. Yeah, sort of. Um, it's not as bad. I mean, I don't know if it's as manipulated as U.S. stuff. Um, like, for instance, if you compare the the John Williams stat, shadow stats to the Fed reporting things, huge differences. Right. I don't know if there's a Chilean shadow stats. Right. But presumably it's it's better than um, just nominal. Better than nominal, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's definitely a big difference to just having to kind of um yeah exactly on. yeah yeah <laughs> lick your finger and put it in the air and try and guess which which way the inflation blows <laughs> yeah or better than argentina where it's like if you don't have a foreign account you're screwed yeah you're yeah. screwed and that must be one of the really important bases for how people have you know more economic freedom here basically mm. that uh, the the money is uh is a lot harder and uh, a lot more secure. Yeah, I so thinking of um, economic freedom, one thing is uh, the culture in Chile. The states is racist with some classism. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chile is classist with some racism. Um, so for a lot of people, they spend a lot on their appearance. Right. Um, and so debt is not a problem like the U.S. or Japan, but there's definitely um, the amount of debt has been increasing. And uh, Chile has some of the same problems that the U.S. does where a student will leave university with essentially a mortgage Mm. but no house. And I think that's uh, one of the main reasons that they're trying to attract foreign capital is they're looking for... Um, sort of jobs for those people who are coming out of university, and it's like, well, what do you what do you do with that? Um, and especially, I mean, personally, I'm pessimistic on Chile in a macro sense because of the copper. They're very reliant on China, and um, I, I think China's uh, bailing wire and cardboard. Right. So, I, I do understand where you're coming from, that because they're quite um, dependent on copper um, as part of the economy. Mm-hmm. I, I guess as a, as a sort of counterpoint to that, you could say, well, look, you know, thinking of Chile relative to everywhere, you know, everywhere is uh, each country has um, yeah. has its vulnerability to changes in world trade, and in some ways, Chile seems to be quite doing quite well in terms of its. Um, fundamental economic growth and monetary stability and entrepreneurship and stuff. 
So, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe China will affect it, but I don't know. This place seems to be doing pretty well. Yeah, and um, I know there's a lot of, uh, like I mentioned, energy is expensive. I know there's a lot of foreign firms looking into hydro here, sort of the um, high-altitude thing pipe, I forget the technical term, mm. but super high-head type things with small flow. And that... Prop, I mean, that has a lot of promise for bringing energy prices down. Which well, they've got a lot of mountains and a lot of water coming out of them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, um, I mean, cheaper energy basically acts as a stimulus for GDP. Mm. Um, on the other hand, as an individual, I don't know how much GDP, like, matters. Mm. Like, if there's a recession in your uh, field, <laughs> you don't really care yeah. if GDP is expanding. Um, like buggy whip makers in the 20th century had a very, very yeah. hard time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, which on the other hand, this reverse is true. If GDP is going down and your um, field is going up, you're fine. Yeah. Um, Chile does not have, I don't think it has the same structural problems as some places like um, the U.S. I mean... There are massive amounts of capital reallocation that need to take place before it has a firm footing. Mm. Um, Chile has... There are some people with a lot of influence, which probably means that there have been uh, unchecked uh, misallocations. Right. So, I mean, I figure influence uh, changes... or allows for prices to not change mm. um, and that's what leads to uh, misallocation yeah I think I understand what you're saying that in a, in a small country where you have a small elite you probably have quite a close relationships with the government mm -hmm. then you're going to have some industries that get protected or mm -hmm. supported and that's going to lead to capital misallocations which ultimately will cause problems in the economy somewhere down the line exactly. and you know everyone's going everywhere's going to have that and chile's going to have its own particular flavor of that but yeah. in general it does seem you know looking at the index of economic freedom that uh, i think it's the heritage, heritage it's, Foundation, yeah, yeah that they do like you know this is yeah foreign, this yeah. is top top 10 in the world and top one in in uh, south america so that's I mean, that's interesting Argentina. <laughs> yeah definitely definitely so now just in terms of the practical side though you are on um right, uh, right. An, an entrepreneurship visa for a year so before that you were doing basically you were sort of coming here and checking it out and doing a Spanish. yeah and yeah. and you can do that by just have, like a visitor visa and going out and coming back so right. pe people can come down here and mm -hmm. just come and check it out and Absolutely. that's fairly straightforward then you know you've gone for this entrepreneurship visa you got that for a year so what happens at the end of that year um so three months before it expires uh, you reapply uh and that's all I know. <laughs> right, right. Um, presumably, they'll be like, "Well, did you start the business? And is it? Do you? Are you actually doing what you yeah. said you'd do?" Um, so yeah, you're, you're probably going to have to present some kind of, you know, I don't know, show your marketing brochure or something like that. Um, it'll probably be a write-up, um, probably bank statements, etc. Right. Um, probably show my passport again, stuff yeah. like that. Um, yeah, I haven't looked into it. Mm. But in terms of the outlook, though, um, it sounds like your future is essentially, okay, so I set up a business, right. I stay here, each year I go back and get my things stamped and carry oh, on. Excuse me. The, so it's first year, you, uh, you get it for, the first time you get it for a year, the second time I think it's another year, the third time it's permanent, so your visa is permanent. And then I think if you've been living here five years, uh, you can apply for citizenship. Right. Um, and I think something we were talking about before is uh, for, most, uh, for most citizens of most countries, um, getting a second citizenship is not as uh, important as for the U.S. citizen um, for tax reasons and stuff. And, like, I don't mind taxes uh, I mean, I'm, I know I'll sound very weird saying that, but the amount I've paid in taxes is way less than the amount, is like a fraction of what has been stolen from me. Um, How do you mean? 
uh, you know, somebody broke into the house and oh, right, uh, right. stole. They went into my room, which is like, ah, damn it. <laughs> um, right, right. And it was like right under the insurance amount, so yeah. whatever. Um, so yeah, that sucks. But anyway, taxes for me are not as big a deal as the U.S. military. Mm. Um, I, uh, I I don't know if I'm, like I didn't, for me, like when Bush was reelected, I said okay, I I don't like where the U.S. is heading and. My perspective right now is it's only going more militaristic, even faster. Mm -hmm. um, more domestic spying, more interfering with uh, other countries' internal uh, policies. And as the petrodollar loses uh, its importance and uh, countries set up bi bilateral trade agreements... Um, the petrodollar will become less and less and less important, which means that for the U.S. to hold on to uh, its current place in the world, the U.S. military, I would not be surprised if it was used more and more, mm. which is already being used quite a bit. Mm. And um, I, 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 the... I don't, so some people are worried about the world just sort of collapsing. I don't know if that will happen, but it will probably reach an inflection point very soon. And we've already talked about the sort of the banking, the new banking regulations in the U.S. For the Catholic Church with excommunication, once there were enough Protestants, there were sort of an inflection point where all of a sudden there were tons and tons and tons of Protestants because once excommunication didn't matter, you might as well just right. go Pretty for right it. Way, yeah. yeah. Um, and so it will probably be small banks who aren't a part of the U.S. system, mm -hmm. and then that will get more and more influence, and then all of a sudden many, many banks will be like, okay, screw this, we're not going to have U.S. citizens, we're not going to uh, deal with U.S. banks. And that could be 10, 20, 30 years mm -hmm. down the road. But um, but your outlook could be then that you know you you uh, come down here you get the business going you um, keep it going and uh, stick around in five years right. time you'll like, you'll have a Chilean passport as well and that's my, yeah that's sort of my plan right now right um, and you know maybe everything uh, stays peaceful in the in the states but if it doesn't then you know you're down here and you've got a an alternate passport so right right. It's um, really cool to hear about what you've done. I think it's a really exciting way to go and try and find more freedom in your own life, you know, and to pursue the entrepreneurship. And I, I really wish you all the best in, in, in your venture. Have you got any other last thoughts that you'd like to share for other people who might be thinking about, yeah, yeah. Thinking about what you're doing and you know, uh, any suggestions or thoughts for them? Yeah, debt. Um, so you did a podcast on freedom from debt. I think that is essential. I I could not be doing what I am doing if I were in debt. Um, it would be impossible um, or incredibly, incredibly risky. Um, so that is key. Uh, also, the unschooling or the uncollege, I think that's going to be more and more uh, something that people do. There's a site, tynan.com, that has a recommendation on uh, the Uncollege MBA or something like that, something for the title, like that for the title, where he recommends learn a language, travel a bit, start a business, which I think is like I've I've learned much more uh, applicable things in the past several months uh, than I did in in school. I definitely learned more theory and things like that but um, in terms of okay well this, these are life skills much more in the past several months and even a lot of what I learned in school was from like traveling mm. <laughs> so I think travel is huge being out of debt is huge if you can do that um, and in the meantime pay down as quickly as you can um, unless you have a reason not to like if you have a rental property and you have a, like a 4%, 5% mortgage, go for it. <laughs> but 
uh, for most people, I think paying off debt is key. Yeah. No, I think that makes a huge amount of sense. If people are interested in getting in touch with you, if they maybe um, want to find out more about you, and also if they're interested in Chile, uh, can they contact you? And, and how do you feel about people getting in touch? Yeah, sure. Um, Edwin in Chile at gmail.com. And if, you know, any questions or, um, I mean, I could talk to Felipe and arrange for something. Uh, so like, like, hey, Felipe, these guys want help. Yeah. And something like that. Yeah, that'd be great. So, yeah, I don't know. Edwin in Chile at gmail.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate all your thoughts and, uh, and very best of luck for your venture. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.